Hello, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Conservation and Adaptation Resources Toolbox, or CART. My name is Carly Jewell. I am a conservation biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Region 2 Science Applications Program. I am also the co-director of CART alongside Genevieve Johnson at the Bureau of Reclamation. And for anyone unfamiliar, CART is a platform for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing and the co-production of decision support tools on key management challenges, such as introduced aquatic species. CART supports different communities of practice, including the non-native species community of practice, which we launched in May of 2020. And if you'd like any more information on CART or our communities of practice, feel free to send me an email. I'll drop my email in the chat once we get going. And with that, I'd like to kind of transition us a bit more to talk about today's webinar and introduce our guest speaker. So I'm really excited to host this presentation with Mary McGraw from the Idaho Department of Parks and Recreation, who will be talking about removal efforts of Chinese mystery snails from Round Lake at Round Lake State Park. Mary has worked for the Idaho Department of Parks and Recreation since 1987 and has been the manager at Round Lake State Park since 2017. Mary maintains park facilities, presents interpretive and environmental education programs, provides recreational opportunities, and supports resource management projects. Mary received a bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point, majoring in forest recreation and resource management. So a really quick final reminder, if you have any questions during the presentation, please just enter them in the chat box and I will relay them to Mary after the presentation. But with that, Mary, we're ready for your presentation. Let me stop sharing. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I do have a PowerPoint presentation. We'll get to that in just a, a minute. First of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to uh, participate today. I think it uh, will be pretty exciting and hopefully, uh, Hopefully everybody will learn something and me included. Um, one of the things I wanted to do was to start out with before we start the PowerPoint program is introduce you to um, our snails. A lot of people think of snails as being relatively small, um, non-conspicuous type animals. These guys are not very small. Um, it is probably inch and a half to two inches in size. I'm not sure if you can see that pretty pretty good um but mary if you these... move it in front of yourself it's not blurred okay okay um it's a little bit better but um yeah they're pretty big so they're relatively easy to find they're they're pretty obvious which i think is what has clued us into the trouble that they are causing um but i just wanted to kind of show you the example what they look like and um and how big they really are. Um, one of the things about these, they're also called trapdoor snail. Um, they have a hard entrance into their shell right there, which is what they do to help protect themselves is to shut that trap door. Um, but with that, I will um, start on the PowerPoint presentation and We'll get rolling here. Okay. Let's see what we're... there we go. Um, before we start, I want to I want to have give you a little disclaimer. You noticed in the bio, nowhere did it say I was a biologist. I am a land manager and um, I'm very interested in resource projects. So as we stuff, some of the scientific names and stuff, I don't even uh, pretend to know how to pronounce them, but I will have them on the screen so that um, you guys will have that reference. So um, to start out with, like I said, thank you. My name is Mary McGraw. I'm the park manager here at Round Lake State Park up in uh, Sagal, Idaho, which is um, Northern Idaho. Um, so with that, like I said, some of the things that we're going to talk about is um, the 
taxonomy. Um, we'll have a couple slides up <clears throat> regarding that. Um, kind of give you an idea of where they fit in in the animal world. Uh, we'll have a short description about uh, the snails. Um, you probably saw the best description just a couple minutes ago. We'll talk about the distribution of the snails, where they came from, and where they are now. We'll talk about ecology, mostly about life cycles and reproduction of the snails. And then we'll talk about um, some actions that we have tried to do to try and remove them from our lake and um, just some other thoughts that we might have. But uh, this is kind of where they fit in, in the scientific world. Um, you guys can see that the genus name is very long. I don't even tend to wanna pronounce that because I will not do a very good job on that. But I wanted you to have that information in case you're interested and want to look that up. Um, also, i to move this a little bit. Um, one of the things about taxonomy is that the oriental snails, um, it can be a little bit confusing. There are many scientific names that are used and there's been some debate about whether um, two of these species are actually uh, synonymous or simply, and just simply uh, different phenotypes of the same species. So the Chinese or Oriental snails in North America are commonly referred to, however you want to pronounce that name. Anybody, uh, we can talk about that a little later, so. Let's see. All right, so the Chinese mystery snail, they're also called the uh, black snail or the trapdoor snail. Um, I talked a little bit about the trapdoor when we first started out, um, hence the name trapdoor snail. Um, it's a large freshwater snail. It um, is in the family of Vivipardi. And the Japanese variety is um, a species that is black and usually a little, little darker green, moss-like algae can cover the shell. So they, they look a little similar, um, the Japanese and the Chinese. That's why a lot of times they're just called Oriental Chinese snails or Oriental mystery snails. Okay, these snails are native to the Southeast Asia, Japan, and Eastern Russia. So they, they're pretty much pretty well distributed um, in that part of the country. Um, here, the non-indigenous distribution of the snail first arrived in the late 1800s, and it was believed that they were a food source um, found in the Oriental markets in places on the West Coast, such as San Francisco. Um, later on, they were discovered in Hawaii um, about the 1900s. And that was also due to the fact that the Chinese immigrants were bringing them over um, as a food source. The Great Lakes region, um, they were discovered between 1931 and 1942. Uh, they believe that it was an introduction um, into the Niagara River, which then flowed, started flowing through the Great Lakes, um, reaching Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, and Lake Michigan in the late 1970s. So once it was discovered, it did take a little while for them to um, move into those areas. Um, even though the snails were first introduced on the West Coast, um, it took them quite a while to actually move over to, they spent most of their time over on the East Coast, um, most of the early eight, 1900s, and then has have recently been discovered on the West Coast um, uh, in the Columbia River Basin in Oregon and Washington State, and now they are in Northern Idaho. There are several lakes in Northern Idaho that are seeing them. Um, some of the places are, are um, mostly privately owned around the lake. 
the around Round Lake, we actually, it's um, all public land. It's all the state park owns that. So I think that became more obvious and uh, at that point. Um, we believe that the West Coast introduction is a result of the pet trade. Um, many of these snails are used in garden ponds and aquariums. So in Round Lake, um, we started seeing the snails about uh, 2017 and 2018. Um, you can see here, picture's not totally clear, but there were quite a few of them in the lake. People were bringing them in to us and it, they were just didn't know what they were, wanted to know what they were. So that really started piquing our interest. And it didn't take us very long to find out that they were um, definitely an invasive species and um, that maybe we should think about pursuing um, more information about them. All right, let's see if we can. Okay, so to give you a little background about Round Lake State Park, it's a um, small lake, it's about 60 acres in size. Um, it does have an inlet creek and an outlet creek. Uh, the inlet creek comes from a larger lake to the east of us called Kokolala Lake. Um, and the, the outlet creek goes to the west and at um, about four miles down, it will, goes into Ponderay River. Uh, the Ponderay River does eventually flow into the Columbia River Basin. So um, it does take a while and it's several hundred miles, but you can see the, the concern. Interesting thing is the creeks, the inlet and outlet, do have a rocky bottom and they're relatively shallow. In the summertime, they're, they vary anywhere from just a few inches deep to maybe just a couple feet deep. So relatively shallow, um, the rocky bottoms, uh, you know, there are fish and stuff moving through there, um, a lot of activity. And the reason I point this out is because snails, these snails tend not to like the rocky bottoms. So that may work to our benefit. We have our fingers crossed about that. Um, we believe the snails were put into the lake through an aquarium dump. Um, unfortunately, um, that is probably 90% of the introduction into the lakes in the Northern Idaho area. Um, Round Lake is has everything a snail could ever want. It has lots of algae, which is um, food for the snails. It has a muddy soft bottom, which can be um, shelter and protection for the snails. And it because it's a small lake, it's only um, about 35 feet deep in the deepest area. So in the summertime, it warms up fairly fast and it stays warm a um, little bit later into the season. So um, those are pretty much the key things that snails do really like. Um, the Chinese snails um, eat predominantly algae or diatoms. Um, here you can see the snail attached to a rock and there's lots of, lots of food there for them. Uh, a lot of people tend to think that they're eating plants. Um, we have quite a few different plants in our lake, uh, milfoil, Eurasian, and, and uh, um, native milfoils. Um, but what they're actually doing, what we've noticed, is they are actually eating the algae on the plants. They don't actually eat the plants. You can't see little chew marks or anything like that. But um, we noticed this because we do bring the snails into the visitor center. And we have plants and different stuff in there to um, keep them going and stuff so that the visitors can actually see what the snails look like, have an idea um, what, they're, what they may be looking for as they remove them. But that is one thing we did notice is that it looks like they are actually eating the plants, but if you look at them closer, they are not. They're eating the algae 
um, attached to the plants and floating around in the water. Um, our lake has a muddy bottom. It is a um, lake that was formed by the glaciers. So it's a pothole lake. It um, was formed about 12,000 years ago and has a very thick layer of mud on top of the, the um, bedrock. So it gives them an opportunity to actually go down into the mud. This in the wintertime helps protect them from the cold. The lake does freeze over in the wintertime. Obviously it does not freeze all the way to the bottom, but it that mud helps keep them warm enough so that they can survive the winter. It also helps protect them from predators. Um, my understanding is in some places they have found predators such as um, raccoons will prey on them. In some areas, um, birds will come and prey on them. And uh, otters are pretty commonly prey on them. Unfortunately, we don't have, we have occasional otter come through here, but not enough to actually be a major predator. Um, and like I said, in the wintertime, they do dig down into the mud to hibernate. One of the things that we did notice in some of the activity that goes on here with people um, actually removing the snails is people's ha people have observed going through an area, picking snails out, moving through the area and coming back and finding that more snails have come up out of the mud. So I, I, I'm guessing that they use this behavior for protection when they perceive that there is um, predators, specifically humans coming through. So we found that to be pretty interesting. Uh, like I said, we have the rocky bottoms in the creeks that come into the lake and exit the lake. Um, we're hoping that this will help from keeping the snails from moving downstream. Um, in the summertime, the uh, snails, the the outlet creek and the inlet creek, I should say, are are very shallow. So it would be pretty obvious if we if we had a large population moving down the uh, down the creeks. Uh, we have not seen that at this point. Not a, there are some occasionally. The mouth of the outlet is pretty muddy, so they do move into there. But we're hoping that this will help deter them from moving downstream. Unfortunately, in the springtime, when the water levels high, we have winter runoff, the water does get high and does move pretty fast. So unfortunately, that would probably be the most obvious outlet for the snails to be moved downstream. So um, that I don't know how we would ever stop, but hopefully it's pretty minimal. That's what we're hoping for. And like I mentioned, um, the outlet eventually will run down into the Columbia River Basin um, through the Pond Bay River and, and, and down that way several hundred miles. The life cycle of the snails, um, it's estimated that the snails will live about five years. Um, females bearing will bear more young in their fourth and fifth year than any other year. Uh, I find that kind of interesting, uh, and, and I think it's pretty typical in in a lot of animals is that as they get closer to the end of their life, they um, will bear more young um, to help perpetuate the species. Um, this summer, we had a little girl bring in a bunch of snails as she was removing them. We were helping her sort them out. Um, she had a lot of, a little bit of mud and, and rocks in there. And as we were sorting them, we noticed that there were different um, age um, of the snails that uh, were in the lake. Of course, um, on the picture to the left, you can see that there's three snails. That was the first picture that we took right after we had found the snails. Um, the bigger, bigger one is probably about the average size of the snails that's removed. Um, the second biggest one um, is still pretty small, but it's still, you know, definitely a trapdoor snail. And then the little one there um, is pretty tiny, and that is 
basically a, a newborn snail. Um, seven days later, we took pictures of the snails again. And the large one didn't seem to grow a whole lot, maybe a little bit, but the other two probably doubled or tripled in size in seven days. So that gives you a pretty good idea of how fast they really grow. Um, we were pretty amazed at, in, in seven days, how how much they had grown, especially that little, little teeny tiny one. The tiny one is probably the size of a pencil eraser. It, it looked like a pebble at first, and and then we noticed that it was not a pebble. It was actually a shell. So we found that to be pretty interesting. So being interested after we found the, the small ones, <clears throat> we decided that we were going to um, crack open a snail to find out what really was going on inside. And then we noticed that the young um, actually were born um, were live born and they are fully developed in their shell. So they're developed in their shell. As you can see in the picture, when we when we peeled the shell away, there's a lot, what you're seeing there are baby snails kind of in a membrane and they're fully intact. And as they start getting large enough, they start emerging from the adult. Um, the adult female does have all stages of development occurring simultaneously within the cell, in, in the shell. So that was kind of interesting. Um, in the larger part of the shells of the adult, that is where the, the oldest ones are. And then up in the tip of the shell are where the very young ones are. And they, um, they were very, very tiny. We'll have a picture of that here in just a second. Um, it's been recorded that the females can actually have up to a hundred young in one brood. So you can kind of see the, where this is going, the, how well they repopulate an area and, um, and can take over pretty quickly. So this is a, another picture of when we opened up the shells. Um, in the ones that we opened, we opened four or five snails and they all had babies in them. They averaged anywhere from about 30 to 40 young in different stages of their of development within one shell. Um, on the upper left picture, you can see those are, all, all of the little ones there came out of one shell. The larger ones came out of the large part of the shell. The upper right-hand picture kind of gives you a better idea of what they look like when they're in the membrane with just the shell removed. Um, and it was pretty fascinating to find all those uh, shells all intact um, right underneath the shell there. Um, the shell of the snail seems pretty large, and I found that kind of fascinating. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to open it. It's like the snail itself is pretty large, but I didn't imagine how much room that those, um, how many babies took up. So the one on the picture on the bottom is the young, just as they are getting ready to emerge. So they are fully intact, have their trap door, have the shell in place, and they're ready to double and triple in size in about seven days. So like I said, you can imagine how fast they can populate a, a lake. One of the things that we have started doing um, or that we found out pretty much is the only real feasible way to remove sn snails from a lake is to do it manually. So we got thinking about this and we, um, in 2018, we're noticing the snails. In 2019, we had done a interpretive program on Labor Day, last weekend, last holiday weekend of the summer season. And we were doing an interpretive program and we decided that we would try a, a technique where we would hand out a piece of paper or a flyer that said, if you bring 12 snails to us, we'll give you free ice cream. 
because we were coming to the end of our season and we had uh, extra ice cream that we probably would just be throwing away anyhow. So we thought it was a win-win for everybody. Um, so we did that. And after a three-day weekend, we received about six to 700 snails um, just for that weekend. So we people seem to pick up on that. They seem to enjoy the fact that they were um, able to help out. And in the removal, for me, it was the best part of the whole program was to create the awareness and to get people aware of what's going on and um, learn a little bit about the invasive species and, and why we should um, be removing them. So between 2019 and 2021, periodically we would do this during weekends, generally holiday weekends, because that's when we had most of our people um, in the park. And um, so it became kind of popular. People would come in and ask us, hey, we're here to um, look for the snails and and want to help remove them. And we would you know, say, oh, we're, we're not doing it this week and we're going to be doing it next week. But they would still go out and they were pretty enthusiastic about removing the snails. Um, in 2022, we decided that we were going to do it the entire summer. We started on Memorial Day weekend and went to Labor Day weekend. Um, we asked them to bring in 12 snails for an ice cream. Uh, many people brought in, you know, at least 12, a lot of times more. A lot of times they brought in hundreds of snails. It became a... Um, an event almost for for groups for families and we collected we estimated about 12,000 snails in 2022 so this year we decided that we were going to do it once again from memorial day to labor day and we upped the snail bounty we we asked for 18 snails per ice cream and we thought well you know if it if it gets difficult towards the end of the season We'll lower the bounty. Well, unfortunately, it did not get, um, it was not difficult to find any snails. They were able to find eight, easily 18 snails to uh, to get their ice cream. And we estimate between 19 and 20,000 snails were removed this summer. So we were amazed at the amount of snails that people were bringing in. And I'm not sure if the fact is that there were more snails or that there was just more people um, participating in the activity. So that is one of the things that we weren't really sure of. Um, let's see. So you know, um, Having the reward for snails, people just really picked up on this. Um, they were happy to get their ice cream, but I think they were just as happy to be doing something meaningful. So one of the things that um, as, as the summer went through and that, you know, some of the things over the last couple of years that we've really learned um, and some of the questions I ask myself is, are we helping the problem or making it worse? By removing the snails, are we encouraging um, higher brood sizes? Um, like I said, there's there's a lot of, when you do stuff like this, for me, there's a lot of questions that come to mind. Um, one of the things I wonder is if we didn't actually remove the snails, would they, would they self-limit themselves based on the size of the lake? And what would that look like? Um, you know, is it something that would be acceptable or tolerable? Um, is it best to continue to remove the snails to try and keep them from spreading downstream? Um, you know, even though I know that we'll never get rid of all the snails, is the effort worth the possibility of not spreading or not spreading them as quickly downstream? Um, as we do more research, we have um, the probability of always coming up with 
more feasible options. Um, pesticides generally are not an option, especially with our lake. Just because it's so big, there's other um, animals, uh, ecosystems within the lake that could be affected by the pesticides. So that's not something that we're willing to do. Um, there is other places up here, like I mentioned before, other lakes that have um, the trapdoor snails in the lake. There's one facility just south of us, about 30 miles. It's a fishing pond that is run by the city of Post Falls. And they have had the snails in their pond. Um, the advantage that they have is that their pond is um, associated with a utility, which then kind of regulates that. But they can drain their pond. Um, they can put water in it when they want to, take water out. It's a, it's a small, about a quarter acre in size. And when they discovered that they had the snails, what they did is they... they um, started doing research, of course, and trying to find out what might be a good solution for them. They drained the pond. They went in and raked the muddy bottom to try and get all the snails out as best that they could. Um, they removed a lot of snails. I, I don't know the exact number. I've heard anywhere from 10 to 12,000. They also left the pond empty through the winter in hopes that the winter would actually freeze out the snails that were remaining in the bottom of the pond. And then the next spring they refilled it because it's a, a very popular fishing pond. So they refilled it um, just to discover that there were probably just as many snails in the pond as when they first started. So their initial start um, to remove it to remove the snails was not as successful as they thought. So they are trying some other options. Um, they have drained the pond and said that they were going to try and wait it out and see if over time that the snails would um, not, would be able to be removed or would die off because of the lack of water and lack of food and all that good stuff. Um, in talking to the manager down there, they they are being optimistic, cautiously optimistic about the results of that, and um, you know maybe willing to try some other options. Unfortunately, the options that they have that they can use are not options that we can use in a sixty acre lake. We can't drain our lake. We can't rake out the bottom. Um, so, you know the, the situations are totally different. But um, it'll be interesting to see if they're able to actually remove all of the all of the snails from their facility. Um, one of the things that is kind of disturbing, you know, where do we go from here? And just to know that invasive species are only a click away is is kind of alarming to me. Uh, if you go on Amazon, you can buy three trapdoor snails for $19.99. So Stuff like that, when when they're so invasive, um, you know, you would hope that some of these places would actually. I understand that they're trying to make some money, and it's an industry, and it's not intended to 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 be an invasive species in the wild. They're intended for other use, but one of the things that I think that we need to do is is to provide a lot of education, as much education as we can about invasive species. Um, you know, we'd try and provide information to our park visitors. It would be helpful if somehow we could reach out to the people that are purchasing live animals and, you know, maybe part of that being that there would be just a little insert, please, you know, be responsible pet owners and don't release your pets into the wild. Um, also the pet products industry, you know, maybe, maybe we could um, do something there too and encourage them to, to be a little bit more responsible and encourage their customers to be responsible. But um, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at with what we're doing. Um, I hope that this will 
help people out. Um, I'm always looking for comments, suggestions, things that we can do, and um, hopefully move forward. We're, we'll probably continue doing our removal of the snails in some fashion. Um, providing ice cream seems to be pretty popular. So at this point, we'll probably continue with that. So that's pretty much what I have for everybody. Like I said, hopefully we can uh, um, have some conversations here and, and I'm always looking for good ideas and new suggestions. So um, thank you. And I appreciate any comments you might have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mary. Well, I have several questions. Um, really fascinating and interesting, but I want to open it up first to the group. Um, looks like, yeah, Teresa will kick us off here in the chat. Um, yeah, talking about um, some efforts that are going on to address the aquatic invasive species and commerce pathway linked to the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force. So Teresa dropped in a, a great link there for those who are interested in learning more about some of those efforts going on. Um, but if anyone else has any questions, um, please feel free either drop them in the chat or you know just unmute yourself and, and jump on. Um, welcome any questions that you might have. I guess more it's more of a comment. Um, so hi, I'm Teresa Thome. I'm our regional aquatic invasive species coordinator here for the Pacific Northwest with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, uh, actually, my colleague uh, Cesar Blanco in Region Eight um, in California has been uh, working with a, a lot of folks in California to try to address. Um, Chinese mystery snail and some of these uh, some infestations that are in occurring in California um, and so just it seems like there might be some lessons learned at um, connecting you all I know that he, he wasn't able to attend this webinar but I he knows that it's recorded so hopefully um, you know some of the your your efforts there in Idaho trying to address this um, you know, there's there's other efforts uh, going on that might be able to to help. So that's a great connection. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah, thank you. And and maybe that's a good question to kind of pose to the room too. Are is there anybody in the room who is working with Chinese mystery snails in areas that they conduct management or research? I'm just curious if anyone else in the room is is working with the species. Oh, Julian does research on them. Interesting. Yep, sorry, I'll speak up because it seems really quiet here. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm Julian, Mary, I'm Julian Olden um, at the University of Washington. But yeah, over the last 10 years or so, I've been have a, some studies looking at um, kind of the role of Chinese mystery snail in a lot of the lake ecosystems here in Western Washington. So what, what role are they playing? Um, how are other non-native species utilizing them as a resource? Which kind of leads to these meltdown events in which there's kind of these positive synergies between invasive crayfish and, and snails. But in terms of context, they're in about 65% of the about of the lakes that we surveyed here. Um, so they're pretty much the cat's out of the bag. Um, and there was some instances, uh, at least stories I've heard from Sam Chan um, down in Oregon about this um, people actually coming up from Oregon across the border and harvesting them to subsequently then sell them in the aquarium trade. Um, so anyways, that's, a, that's, that's a rare, a rare, definitely a rare thing, but yeah, they're, they're super abundant here, um, in, in our lakes. Thanks for jumping on, Julian. Uh, it looks like 
Bradford is working on invasive mollusks in Northwestern California, but not this specific species. Thanks for dropping that in the chat. Francis, I see that you have your hand raised. Do you wanna come on and ask a question? Yeah. Hi, Mary. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, so I am an intern through the Virtual Student Federal Service, actually with Carly at CART. Um, and I'm writing a case study on um, spring snails in Arizona right now. And one of the things that I'm talking about in this case study um, is invasive species out there, which is why I'm here, because I wanted to see if there's you know, any uh, similarities. But it's really interesting all that you were talking about here. Um, what you made me think, though, when people are buying these invasive species, um, just kind of ways to talk to them about what they might be doing and how they could handle their pets if they no longer want them. Have you guys um, kind of thought about together with the pet having, I don't know, some sort of, like if it's online, having like a I guess disclaimers, not the word to use here, but we're going to use it. Um, just talking about like what it might cause um, if you do release this pet into the wild in your area. Um, something along those lines. Have you guys done anything like that? I don't know. We no, we haven't addressed anything like that. Um, most of what we've been doing is directly con, you know, dealing with our visitors, what the issue is. Um, a lot of the youth groups come in. Uh, we have several um, church, uh, not church groups, uh, camp, nature camps and stuff come in. So those kids range anywhere from five to 12 years old and getting the kids to realize what's going on, that goes a long ways in, in uh, you know, for adults, you can tell adults, but if their kids are going to tell them, they're going to pay attention. So we definitely will target the, the kids. Um, we also just want to make people aware, but it's a great idea of, you know, what is this costing, um, you know, the state, the people of Idaho, um, when you put numbers to it, that, that'll probably make it pretty real. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. And so I'm seeing in the chat here, um, Teresa did post a link to the Don't Let It Loose program, which is a really awesome resource uh, that promotes responsible pet ownership. It's a great kind of educational campaign. Um, definitely encourage folks to take a peek at that if they're interested in thinking about ways to promote education of responsible pet ownership. Um, and then Julian also put a cut full articles, at least one, maybe a second one too. Yeah, here we go in the chat. Um, that might be of interest for folks thinking about consumption of Chinese mystery snails by native and non-native crayfish, as well as um, estimating the rates of grazing and filter feeding by Chinese mystery snails. Interesting. Um, I have a question and maybe if others, if others have questions, feel free to jump in. Um, but I'm curious a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of the um, kind of volunteer removal efforts. So do my first question is, do those folks go through some type of training session beforehand, or is it just kind of a, on a day of the event, you'll walk through kind of removal techniques and strategies and do some of that educational component? Yeah, generally we'll do some sort of interpretive program. And it'll talk about, um, you know, what they are, why they're, why we don't want them in here, some of the things that they, you know, they're doing to our lake, um, overpopulating. And then we just asked them to remove them. We encourage them to, you know, they handle them. We give them bags and stuff like that. Um, but when they come in, then we encourage them to actually wash your hands, provide some hand sanitizer, stuff like that. Um, a lot of times it's a great opportunity for the kids to, you know, like, oh, how many do you have? And they're like, we don't know. So then they get to count them and, and you get to do other things with them. And um, sometimes actually very seldom do they ask us what we do with them after we collect them, which kind of surprised me. But sometimes they will ask. And then we tell them that we 
you know, humanely euthanize them. And they'll ask how we do that. And we tell them that we put them in the freezer and we leave them in the freezer for 24 hours and that will euthanize them. And then, then they will no longer be a threat to our legs. So um, that seems to go over. Okay. Um, but like I said, it's actually pretty common or uncommon for them to ask that they're just excited to have their ice cream mostly. But um, actually we had a two young men. I, I don't, young boys, I should say. They're probably eight, 10 years old, something like that. Last summer they came in and it was an opportunity for them. They were um, charged with bringing the Boy Scout treats for that evening. So they came to the park, they collected enough snails to get ice cream for all the kids in the, at their troop meeting. So, you know, it provided them an opportunity to do something um, with conservation and, and then provide the treat for all of their, their scout mates. So um, I thought that was kind of a novel way of, of doing that. It didn't cost them any money out of their pocket, just a little bit of time. Um, and then they got to tell the story to their troop, troop mates. So, um, but we see stuff like that going on all the time. Kids actually paying attention, knowing what's going on, what they're doing, why they're doing it. Um, so in, in my mind, that's, that's the big, benefit that we're getting out of doing this. Awesome. I thought I saw another hand, but maybe, um, yeah, Teresa, feel free to jump on. Yeah, I was, um, here I've got a picture. So, um, you know, the, the mystery snails are great habitat for zebra and quagga mussels too. Oh my goodness. And so that's um, just another, uh, you can use them as substrate for um, looking for other invasive mollusks. So this is a picture from um, our uh, my lake in Minnesota where I grew up. And so now we have these mystery snails are invasive and we have z invasive zebra mussels. So anyway, just <laughs> they, uh, they're all in the mix. So anyway, there's another idea there. <laughs> Oh, also, wow. um, you know, the mystery snails do uh, transmit um, parasites. There's a tree. Most of our snails have um, really specific um, trematode parasites where there's a really, uh, you know, specif specificity there with the parasite, but then more generalist for things like waterfowl or even sometimes people. And so that's, um, you know, the, the whole parasite load that different snails have is um, can be pretty um, disruptive to ecosystems. So that's another concern with um, mystery snails and other mollusks. So anyway. Wow, that is quite the photo, Teresa. Thanks for sharing. Um, and good to, to think about some of those other impacts that they are having on, on native species. I know that Julian added another article, which is fabulous. I love that. Um, to the Sorry, definitely not self-promoting. I just, I just <laughs> know that hardly any work has been done on Chinese mystery snail, and it's been, you know what I mean. It's a crusade, crusade of mine over the last twenty years since starting to work on them in Wisconsin. Yeah. So I just, yeah, that's the. It's a little pet projects that I do. So, anyways, with apologies, and thank you, Mary, for a great presentation. Oh, thank you. I appreciate all your uh, comments and suggestions. And, um, you know, hopefully we can share our emails and, you know, anything that you can share that would be so beneficial to us. I've been just kind of taking this on by myself. I have a lot of support from our department. Um, the director of Parks and Rec was pretty fascinated that I was willing to give away ice cream to uh, get rid of snails. Uh, and she definitely supported that. So, Anything that I can do to help move that forward and maybe make um, some impact on what we can do or, you know, eliminate it in another area, um, that's, that's my hope. Wonderful. Yeah. And, I, you know, we, we hope that these webinars can be an opportunity for folks who are out there doing work on the ground to also connect with those who are, 
are researching these topics and try to have these conversations and um, learn together. So that's fabulous. Any other questions? Okay, great. Well, let's do a bit of closing here. Um, and, you know, really just want to thank everyone for taking the time to join today. Uh, the webinar was recorded and will be made available on CART's YouTube channel. And please share it with those who might be interested who didn't get to see it today. Um, you can also check out the CART case study dashboard. We currently have 190 published case studies. And if you received this webinar invite and it wasn't from me, um, you likely aren't yet on our mailing list, but we would love to add you. So just go ahead. You can send me an email. Um, I'm going to drop my email as well as some other links in the chat here. But just thank you again all for your time. The special thanks, Mary, for putting together this presentation and, and leading this excellent webinar. Um, we hope to see everyone again soon. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.